Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out, tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we are at the Sound Education Podcasting Conference, and we have a very special guest who may, we're sort of a guest on his show too. But anyway, let's call it <laughs> let's call it. You're our guest, uh, Scott Aaron Lepisto from the Itinera Podcast. Hi. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really glad that we could finally meet after so many years of knowing <laughs> each other virtually. <laughs> I know it's been a lot of that this <laughs> this last few days. It's true. So uh, everyone can. Um, take for granted that our audio won't be necessarily exactly the same as it usually is because we are sitting in a room at Boston University. Oh no, what is what is the building we're in? I, I keep losing track. I think we're in, aren't we in Boston University? What's WBUR? Is that the, it's I, called Keelop. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, say I just keep going places in this city and have it's, no idea. It's either Boston University or Boston University adjacent, so that's, I think, good enough. Right. Yes, yeah. yes. So we're... Uh, just finishing up a three or four day long. I mean, for us, it's about Wednesday. three days. Yeah, it started on Wednesday, today, Saturday. Yes, However four many days. days. <laughs> um, conference, and we thought we would talk a little bit about the conference, report on it, um, about what's been happening, and also talk to Scott a little bit because he's always interviewing other people for his podcast. Ooh. So we want to put him on the In spot the a little seat. bit. <laughs> yeah. Did we, did we not tell you that? This is an ambush. Oh, this no. is a, one of those gotcha <laughs> interviews that I'm always doing with my guests. Oh, yeah. I, in fact, remember you explicitly saying to people, this isn't a gotcha <laughs> interview. <laughs> It's Problems, true. Yeah. I have never done a gotcha no. interview. It's I can't imagine not, doing not it. Not quite on brand for Itinera. No, and I, it, it just sounds stressful. I wouldn't want to do it anyway. Yeah. I'd have to hone my journalistic chops, I think, <laughs> to to really grill someone. Yeah. How so? How how has your conference been so far? Anyways, <laughs> so it's been fantastic. I mean, we got to meet. I have met all kinds of great people and. The thing that I've really enjoyed about the conference is that it really represents the whole educational podcasting ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I've met mm -hmm. people in media, in journalists, independent podcasters, academic podcasters, and just meeting um, all these people who are passionate about what they're doing and who are okay doing a, a, a niche thing. Mm -hmm. And I think in podcasting, you know, everyone is really curious. Everyone loves to learn. Everyone is really enthusiastic. And at least in my experience, no one has an ego, right? We're mm -hmm. all podcasters, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We're all okay having our niche, cool kind of interests. And so, um, yeah, it's just a great, great atmosphere, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I agree, especially with that last point. I mean, I'm sure there are some out there. The good thing is if they have enough of an ego to think they're special, they're not here. Right, yeah. right, <laughs> yeah. Or, the, you know, even if they are at the conference, they, you know, maybe just came in, did their one thing and then left or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah. they're not they're not sort of, you know, hanging around with that attitude. Yeah, I have not crossed paths with, with any anyone. of these hypothetical yeah. egoists. Yeah. So exactly. I'm not yeah. trying to like that was not a subtweet. That was not <laughs> me saying there's somebody out there. Just that they're either invisible or they don't exist. They, they don't exist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So. And certainly some of the people who've been here are, uh, at least within our area of the world, um, quite big names um, and are do not act that way at all. Yeah. yeah which is really nice. Mike yeah. Duncan met the OG uh, yeah. last night. Yeah. Um, and yeah, can be a nicer guy. Yeah. And no, no ego, no, no pretension. In fact, quite clearly, slightly terrified by the sort of... <laughs> pedestal people are putting him on yeah, yeah. <laughs> he keeps going like i don't think i can handle this but that's okay yeah. and we were just at the um talk between him and robin pearson um where they talked about the transition between rome and rome or mm. rome and byzantium you know how are they still rome and how are they not and robin pearson is also um i mean he was inspired by mike duncan and took up the reins after him so he comes he is the um, the follower in that sense, but he's also a very, it's a big, very big podcast now too, and very important and people, and the two of them were just not, you know, they were just hanging out afterwards and like really interested to talk about mm. their subject. That's all that they care about. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I th that's been my, certainly my experience too. That I mean, um, both this year and you know we were at the conference last year, and we we met you know a whole bunch of podcasters with like huge followings, and they were just you know in there with everyone else, um, you know, chatting and. It's the opposite of a zero sum atmosphere. Yes, right. It's the it's opposite. A, it's absolutely a rising tide lifts all boats thing. Yeah, everybody here is really interested in getting people to want to listen to podcasts, period. And like, it's not about, I want that. Of course, everybody wants people to listen to their podcast. Yes. But like, basically we all just, it's because it's sort of a fledgling industry. There's this very much this feeling like it will help all of us. If more people out there know that they exist, think they're a real thing, care about them, all of the, have better searchability, whatever the particular details are. Even if the individual person you're speaking to never listens to your podcast, if they go out there and listen to podcasts, it's better for all of us. And all, everybody is definitely thinking like that. Well, and it's also a question of getting people used to listening to podcasts since it is mm. a very new medium. Um, if, if, if people are sort of whatever podcast they listen to, they build that into their lives, then suddenly that opens the door for everyone. It's shocking to me. So I've been a consistent podcast listener since... 2000, 2009. Mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so it's, I've been, I guess, I think that that's one, you know, we can, we can get in, get in deeper into the conference. So this is something that I've been kind of thinking through because everyone kind of has this feeling like something big is going to happen, <laughs> yeah. right? And you do the podcast and the podcast is going to open up these doors, but we don't know how to monetize it, but we can, it's maybe not necessary for us to monetize it. Maybe it can be this value-added thing that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily lead directly to a, an outcome, but kind of in a circuitous way. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just, you know, I've been listening now for a decade. Right. And so I'm like, given that the bubble hasn't burst yet, like, is it going to burst? Like, mm -hmm. I, guess, I guess it will, and we'll all benefit in various ways. And I certainly benefit in terms of connecting with you two, mm -hmm. in terms of connecting with my guests, mm -hmm. in terms of having an impact on my audience. But it's kind of, yeah, did you feel, I mean, here I am turning the tables in <laughs> classic <fine>. interview <laughs> mode. Um, but did you, what's your take on the, the optimism? Because there's a mm -hmm. real spirit of optimism mm -hmm. here. And maybe I'm just... Maybe I'm just kind of a deeply cynical pessimist. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't be. know what you're filling it in with. <laughs> well, I just, you know, I know what's happened to journalism. Right. I know what's happened with academia. I know all of these places where like the bottom has fallen out and it's kind of like the bottom is being built in podcasting. Right. And so I'm wondering if that experience has kind of tempered my view and mm -hmm. maybe that's given me a kind of false sense of pessimism or maybe the sense is we really are on the brink of something and that we can use these podcasts in to, to add value to all kinds of different organizations in ways that need not be a kind of like, you know, you pay for the podcast, yeah. but can, can add value in all of these other ways. Yeah, I mean, I think that's... So I feel optimistic, but I think it's important to know what the optimism... Like, is it going to break? Is it going to be the big thing? I think it is, but it depends how you define the next big thing or define mm. success or define like the, the, what's going to happen because I don't think, but I might be wrong, but be, you know, I'm not really thinking about this as a business or in a business way and haven't been ever. So I'm not following all the ins and outs of it. You know, there's stuff about that here. So I've heard some stuff about it. I don't see we're on the edge of it suddenly becoming profitable. Like, Basically, right. like right. that's I just don't for the vast majority of it is already profitable for some people. It will continue to be it will become more profitable for more people. I do think that's true. But I don't I, I could be totally wrong, but I don't see that happening in a transformative way. Like I see that happening in a continual, gradual way. They figure out better things about ads. We learn more about analytics. It becomes easier to do an ad based model. Then there's also like donor supporting models and all of those things happen and they happen in a gradual, ongoing way. Um, but without becoming like a huge thing, what I do have a lot, but I, but I'm not worrying about that as that, you know, I have a lot of privilege in that. I don't have to make my li living off of it. Um, I think that I have a lot of optimism for it becoming a truly established thing. <laughs> I, I have optimism that po podcasting is going to become a thing. 
basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's really what I'm trying to say. And, it, and it's been a thing and in, it has in our been lives a big thing. for yeah. a long time. And I think yeah. that I do think that that number is growing. Like the people who feel that way about it are is growing. That the ability for it to become so there's like certain levels of user unfriendliness to it as a genre that still exist. Like searchability for finding a new podcast, very bad ease of transcription for having transcripts there's a lot of you know there's accessibility issues about podcasting there's problems with archiving and like i think but i think those things are really being worked on and so i and then i think once those things get figured out a little bit more i yes i i am quite optimistic that it will continue to go and i don't know whether meteorically or slowly and i don't personally really care um to go on to be something that is you know, really genuinely useful and pleasurable to a bunch of people. And if I think of that as like the end goal, I'm really optimistic about that. I don't think it's going to vanish. I don't think it's going to become played out or oversaturated or whatever. So that's where my optimism is. And I think if that is what the optimism, and I think there are people here who definitely want it to be, need it or want it to become monetarily useful. And I don't know where we're at on that. But on the other kinds of optimism, I think that they're, my feeling is they're warranted. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 thinking about this in terms of, you know, itinera is one thing. Itinera I'm doing, you know, and the audience really is undergraduates who have taken at least a classics course or two. Like I think that you do need to have a little bit of some sort of connection to the classical world. And above, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of like there is this threshold in terms of thinking about my audience growth. Mm -hmm. So I'm not necessarily envisioning all the different ways that I could turn Itinera into some sort of profitable venture. I mean, Itinera is really about me. It's about the community, um, a labor of love in many respects, um, you know, and, and I do like having an impact on an audience that appreciates what I do. I'm also thinking about this, though, in terms of in terms of what uh, Bharat Anand said at the um, one of the several keynote addresses. Yeah, yeah. There were many, an unusual number of keynote addresses. Um, we were highly keyed up. <laughs> yes, we were very a lot of locks. I don't know. <laughs> um, so one thing that he said is that every company now thinks of itself as a media company. And then also talking to the university podcasters who said that, you know, a university podcast can't sound like an ad, you know. And so thinking about – I'm sort of thinking about this not only from my, like, the, you know, my personal situation, but I'm thinking about it from the perspective of universities, the per perspective of companies, kind of thinking about it in this sort of global way and thinking about kind of – I don't know. Yeah. So that's kind of where, where, where I'm thinking about it. I mean, you know, um, yes, support, I, I'll set up a Patreon page at some point, donate, to, <laughs> donate to the show through PayPal, do all those things. I love it. Thank you. But, um, yeah, but in terms of itinera, I'm always, yeah, it's really for classicists mm -hmm. and even entry level classicists. Yeah. And so there's, yeah. so there's a ceiling to that audience exactly. anyway. And, and I not, know it. Yeah. And it's kind of well, it's and, built in. And I mean, in many ways, I think that's true for us, even if it's not the same for the same reasons, exactly. And I would say that the, the interesting comparison to make is between the world of podcasting and the world of YouTube, which had a very meteoric, you know, rise. Uh, and it's tied to one very specific platform. So I'm not, saying that there isn't optimism in the YouTube community, but it's very tempered with the pessimism. Mm. Um, so there are people who think, yeah, you know, I just have to wait for my channel to catch and I'll make it big or whatever. Uh, but there is very much an awareness that, uh, you know, it's frustrating and, uh, you know, you could be put producing the best quality stuff, but if the algorithm doesn't like you, you know, you, you'll just never go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And because, and, and that it feels like it's, you know, there's a one, even though they're not actually a gatekeeper, not nearly good enough gatekeeper, in fact, uh, that YouTube stands as sort of like this intermediary between all creators and anything else. And that the, the that's the big variable with podcasting, even though there are certain big platforms, 
there are in fact no platforms in 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 some realistic ways and actually that also came up at that panel right that um the the guy who spoke before whose name oh tom webster from edison uh, mm. analytics uh research um in comparing podcast audiences to feral hogs so i hope all of our <laughs> listeners i hope all of our listeners appreciate that you are all apparently not i don't remember what he said they weren't like domestic cattle or something like that that you can herd places they are instead feral hogs rampaging through the various sources and platforms that they can get their um, podcasts on um, but he his point there was that people uh, access podcasts through all sorts of different ways. They don't even necessarily even all think of what a podcast is the same way. Like, there's no question about what a YouTube video is. It's yeah. a video that's on YouTube. There's only one thing that is a YouTube video. But a podcast could be on different platforms. It can be different formats. It, but it can also even be, like, actually an audiobook, but you call it a podcast because you think of them all as the same. Or it could actually be um, an audio play that is in, you know, Stitcher premium material that's basically a sketch or a magazine article. Like, so people don't even all call the same things podcasts. And so there's this sort of wider, much more varied, and there's no particular, and the, I don't see anything on the horizon that's going to change that. Like, I didn't, nothing I heard here suggested any kind of real consolidation, which I'm actually really glad about. It it continues certain problems of discoverability, of um, sort of fragmentation of audience, but at the same time, consolidation, and another person on that panel said, um, consolidation flattens, right? You consolidate, it flattens the diverse voices, it flattens the diverse perspectives, it, the, the different formats. You get only a few things and they're always the big people and that's horrible yeah and, and that's that is, totally contrary to the spirit of podcasting yes, and absolutely. we all need to be like no 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 yeah i i really hearing you articulate it that way i'm just like this would be so horrible for yeah. the medium and can you and, and i mean that has happened on youtube not youtube is very diverse too in some ways but because of like the feedback loops of the algorithms and things like that it has tended towards what is the most popular material. Okay, now everybody has to make their material like the most popular material. So there's an ongoing like, oh, uh, all the videos were short until the algorithm started v uh, valuing viewing time. And if, you, any, if you've ever noticed that videos on YouTube are much longer than they used to be, it's because longer videos started to get algorithmically topped, you know, we've got more love, and so everybody started increasing their video lengths. And, exactly. and I mean... Yeah. We, uh, our video has got longer because you can't stop writing. So that's <laughs> different. It was problem. a fortunate coincidence, <laughs> maybe. Fortunate. <laughs> you can't see the air quotes, but trust me, there are air quotes here. That's from the person who does the production side <laughs> of those videos. But yeah, and I don't see that currently happening. I mean, I think there's moves and, and there's pieces that there's more cor corporations involved with it. There's more networks. There's uh, as celebrities move into podcasting. You know, every top 10 list of podcasts is exactly the same top 10 podcast. And they're all people who are famous before they were on podcasts. And, but, but I don't actually think that's really mattered. There's still this huge diversity and people are still finding all the other stuff if they want it. Yeah, there's not only one way to find podcasts. There may not be any one great way to find podcasts, but there isn't only one <laughs> not great way to find podcasts. Yeah. So, uh, so you don't have to feel like you, you have to be a clone of you know, these five podcasts that are really yeah. popular. I mean, yeah. sure, there's a ton of true crime because true crime did really well, but that didn't stop anybody else from doing what they were doing. Yeah. Nobody changed their format to true crime because it was the only way they could survive in the medium. Yeah, it's a sort of an analogy there. You just got a whole bunch of new true crime podcasts after Serial. So, actually, I haven't listened to any oh, true crime. I would. I can't imagine listening to true crime. It is so not anything I'm interested in. But that's fine. Yeah, more, I more power to you. Again, yeah. same thing. Like yeah. it's not just within the educational community. Like in general, not all podcasts are good podcasts. There are podcasts out there that are bad for the world. But most podcasts are like a, just just a good thing. Do whatever you want to do. Enjoy your life. What, listen to whatever podcast you want, and if you happen to expand into some of the ones that we do, great. If you don't, it's fine. Of course, if you don't, you're not listening to this. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Now, we've talked a lot about itinerary. Why don't you tell our listeners what itinerary is, and then maybe we can tell your listeners what our podcast is, just so we you know, do that. Perfect. <laughs> yes. I've, I've, I've given this speech many times <laughs> at this uh, conference. Yes, we it's should actually... be practiced now. <laughs> It's actually been interesting just getting reactions to the idea of, 
of the podcast from people who are totally outside of classics. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, Itinera is a podcast in which I interview classicists about the relationship between their lives and their work. So how they got interested in studying ancient Greece and Rome, how their research evolved, how their teaching evolved. So uh, an example of this is, for instance, Amy Richland, who is a scholar of Roman sexuality and pornography, Mm -hmm. this groundbreaking scholar. Um, She was also uh, a member of one of the first co-ed classes at Princeton. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine kind of what she went through as a woman scholar doing this groundbreaking work on quote-unquote transgressive subjects. Mm -hmm. So it's really documenting how the study of the classical world has impacted the lives of my guests. Mm -hmm. And how their lives have impacted the classics too, at least in her case. Totally. Uh, I mean, everybody's case to some degree, but hers is particularly uh, oversized in terms of its impact because her, her work is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I particularly enjoyed that, (laughs) that episode, I will say. Amy is a very fascinating person. (laughs) Absolutely. Great talker. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, do you want to describe ours, Mark? I, I know you've been doing a horrible job of that so far at the podcast. <laughs> so I'm going to make at the conference. I'm going to make you do it. I, I mean, it, I, I think we have done a horrible job of uh, making a describable podcast. Really <laughs> the, the problem, uh, though, it is called the endless, the knot, endless knot, which kind of is fitting. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. We, we can hope so. Yes. <laughs> there was some reason to our, <laughs> our name. <laughs> I mean, I guess the the main core idea of our podcast is the way things are connected. And the way that we sort of come to it ourselves is from uh, the way language and history are are connected. So it's, you know, very historically contextualized um, language. Uh, But it also, therefore, can open up into theoretically anything. And so, I mean, there's lots of literary stuff that we talk about, but we also can do uh, interviews with people who do stuff that we don't do. Um, So we can talk to, you know, musicians, we can talk to artists, we can talk to authors, uh, we can talk to scientists. Uh, And so uh, it's kind of, you know, interesting how things have these unexpected, surprising connections. Um, And that, you know, that's what what we like to explore. In a way, we sort of started it with the, the mindset of let's kind of try and recreate our uh, over dinner conversations, which sort of meander and we, you know, touch on all kinds of different things that suddenly we found that day or, you know, was interesting. Uh, And so that's kind of how it works. It's just that kind of conversation. My short form of that is, oh, yes, our podcast is about etymology, language and history. Because, that's, you know, you got to have your, your elevator yeah, pitch. But just, just to work. touch on, yeah, both but accurate, I mean, totally, both and that, that's, you know, yours is a very good description, and that can, interconnectedness, I mean, in many ways, it's shorthand excuse for anything we like and is interesting, <laughs> and things we do know, and then things we don't know. And, you know, obviously, we've talked to a lot of scholars in our own fields as well, especially when they write interesting books, but... Um, and we need to get back. I think to we. I think more recently we've done less of the like random people with random interesting connections, mm-hmm. because we've just had a lot of other people we wanted to talk to. But um, I, I think that's a something we'll certainly keep coming back to. I learned a lot through your weird episode. Oh, you yeah, devoted yeah. an episode to weird and mm-hmm. the connections between weird and fate, mm-hmm. and kind of how that you know how this this. I mean, you could say it better than I. But uh, yeah, but it takes us an hour. So <laughs> <laughs> basically, about how this idea of uh, fate gets transformed into our sort of prosaic word meaning unusual, out of the ordinary, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, that's the you would. Yes. It's a cold note version. <laughs> you can, you can either choose the short, slightly <laughs> inaccurate version or the excessively long, accurate version. <laughs> yeah. So we'll choose your own adventure yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's exactly the sorts of um, things that we find interesting. And, and we, the videos uh, that we make are also part of the podcast in the sense that we go back to older videos and like play the audio from them and then talk about more stuff and and expand that because, well, you know, you already got the content. You might as well use it again. Um, But it is a different medium. And I know that lots of people who watch the videos never listen to the podcast and lots of people who listen to the podcast don't watch the videos. And I understand that. I'm more of a podcast person and you're more of a video person. 
in terms of consumption. Though I do consume a lot of podcasts as well, but yeah. but I certainly have a lot more videos in my sort of regular, you know, daily routine. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And and I think that you know they fit into different lives differently as media, um, in terms of like just pragmatically what you can do. <laughs> I watch a lot of. <laughs> I mean, my podcast consumption is is pretty varied. Um, in terms of my video consumption, I stick with a lot of food <laughs> related YouTube videos, how, like recipe, how tos, um, restaurants. Well, like, <laughs> like I like Good Mythical Morning, in okay, which they yeah. eat like several different varieties of frozen pizza and rank which one is best. Yeah. So you can tell these are the videos I watch at the end of the day yeah. when I'm kind of like turning off my brain yeah. and getting ready and there to is a in. very good place in any <laughs> life for that sort of thing absolutely <laughs> there's yeah. another channel called townsend's and sons which is about life in america during the revolutionary war kind of period okay like 1700s yeah. um but also i mean they they cover a wide swath but the guy dresses up in a pretty goofy outfit <laughs> and cooks food characteristic of the time <laughs> based on like recipe books yeah, that, yeah. that survive uh so i'll watch that that too yeah. so definitely in the maybe cut out this whole thing i, don't <laughs> people thinking I, am, uh, I don't no, know i think that i i those are oh, so great <laughs> frankly um no the only reason i don't watch youtube videos is because i'm always trying to multitask and youtube videos yes. are hard to multitask so that, that's that's the that's the limiting factor i mean there's tons of stuff and like my dad who's very intellectual in various sorts of ways the only thing he watches on youtube other than diy which there's lots of and that's very useful uh is uh, fail videos it's, <laughs> i mean it's intensely embarrassing uh, he'll watch our videos because he's related to us but and, and enjoys them yeah. but but basically he better. sits there and watches <laughs> fail videos i mean it's it's thank it's you for saying this i feel yeah. fine now <laughs> yeah so food <laughs> historical reenactment food is like highbrow <laughs> you're good <laughs> anyway and that brings us we should also talk about the panel that you were on uh, scott because one of the reasons you're here is because we uh i i organized we pe people organized and i was one of them um a panel on uh I had this sudden moment of like, which one were you on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a panel on a podcasting in the classroom, specifically using podcasting assignments for teaching other topics. And you were on that panel. So maybe you want to talk a bit about that. Yeah, it was great. And, uh, you know, thank you again for yeah. inviting me on and involving me in this wonderful conference. Um, yeah. So I talked about the uh, podcasting assignment that I used in Greek history. Mm -hmm. I had students, uh, we, I assigned a podcast as just part of the class instead mm -hmm. of a text for certain parts. Uh, I had them evaluate other podcasts mm -hmm. and then I just gave them the opportunity to uh, pitch me their podcast idea and you know kept it really open and then they went out and recorded it instead of uh doing a traditional research paper um so yeah i i think you know i just like the idea of creatively empowering my students to mm -hmm. tackle a topic that they're interested in and kind of embed classics within some kind of meaningful memory that they're going to have of, mm -hmm. of working on this this podcast yeah and yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, some some cool results and and with the podcasting format, you know, there were radically different formats that were equally successful. Mm -hmm. The one that was totally unscripted where people are just, you know, shooting the shit for an hour about some topic that they've researched worked great. Yeah. Right. I could hear them thinking I could hear them analyzing the text you know, great. And then there were others that were highly scripted, included sound, mm -hmm. editing, mm -hmm. like NPR level broadcasting work. I mean, really excellently produced podcasts. And those were also great. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, lots of different ways to find success there. Um, but yeah, I, it worked out well. And it's, it's something that, you know, I mean, I find obviously very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And I think my students found it satisfying to to do it too. Yeah, in fact, thank, listening to that and then thinking about Mike Duncan's keynote from this morning, which he also did uh, in addition to the other panel, I think if I'm going to do, because I was talking to you about how I want to do a podcasting assignment in my classes too, uh, I think I'm going to incorporate, and goodness knows, maybe I'll actually see if I can find and show them that talk, but the part specifically about 
you know, what do you get out of podcasting? Because his his answer to that in part was that the podcaster gets uh, the joy of creation. I'm, I'm not getting the, the terminology exactly right, but the joy of creation, the satisfaction of an of accomplish accomplishment, and then the, and the breadth of knowledge, the widening of their own knowledge, regardless of audience. And I think, and he said it better, and he said it very persuasively, and I think that that would be really good to play to the class or to have them listen to for such an assignment, because basically you're saying, I want you, this is what I want you to get out of it, especially because you may or may not actually be able to put that podcast out into the world. So students aren't necessarily going to get, you know, so the people will listen to it and learn from it part is harder to implement for a bunch of logistical reasons. Uh, so focusing on what are you, you know, why are you doing this podcast? Well, this is the thing you're going to get out of it. You're going to learn this topic, but also here, here's the, the, what, what it's going to mean for you as a podcaster or what I hope it will mean for you as a podcaster, even if it's only a one episode podcaster. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing I think about, and I can totally see this in other fields, and I'd be interested to kind of get your thoughts about whether we could do this in classics, mm -hmm. but I really think, so I don't know the evidence well, but I know that there's some evidence indicating that podcasts help to breed empathy, mm -hmm. that, that hearing people and hearing their voice does something to people mm -hmm. that reading doesn't. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking about this in the context of one podcast I listen to is Ear Hustle, mm -hmm. which is um, a podcast from San Quentin Prison. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about kind of hearing Mike Duncan talk about it, I really do think that podcasting, you know, I, I do think that there are some some podcasts that peddle horrible ideas and I don't think that the hosts know what they're talking about. I uh, won't won't say any names, but mm -hmm. we know well, I mean, Joe Rogan pedals yeah. like I think damaging. we can say his name. I don't yeah. think uh, <laughs> I don't yeah. think anybody's going to be in any doubt. Yeah, right. He says, yeah, he awful. yeah. So he, he, podcasting as a medium will not save the world if people are horrible on it. But right, right. It so is a vehicle for yes, him. yes, and we we all need. I mean, he's an awfully big ele elephant uh, mm -hmm. in 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 the room, so to speak. And I just don't think he has a deep understanding of any sort of context yeah, at all yeah uh cultural context historical context nothing mm. like that <laughs> enters his worldview unfortunately yeah he has n no understanding of that that caveat as aside i do think that podcasting as a medium in terms of promoting empathy in terms of breeding empathy i think is a good thing and i think that there's got to be ways of incorporating that into teaching mm -hmm, that, that mm -hmm. we could actually, um, I don't know. I just, one thing that I think about a lot is just, you know, students' brains aren't developed until they're 25, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that you are teaching them some emotional information mm -hmm. about kind of how to meet expectations, mm -hmm. how to act like an adult, the way that, you know, your behavior, even if you're not intending something, signals something to other people. And these and kinds has of consequences. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And these kinds of emotional skills, I think, or these emotional capacities, perhaps, uh, is, is a better term, is something that I think podcasting as a medium has advantages in promoting. Right. And yeah. I'm thinking about like, Classics is a little mm. harder because our subject matter is more remote, but maybe there are ways of going at it. I don't well, know. I mean, there is, there's so much in classics right now where empathy is desperately needed and understanding of the other. I mean, and I mean in the discipline, but I mean in the discipline, you know, like yeah. not, not only in the subject matter, and that's always important to the subject matter, but in right now, like the as you and I both know, yes, the community yes. of individuals of our discipline for a whole host of reasons, needs to think about how we as can start acting like adults do. But also, um, but being empathetic and understanding the consequences of terms and words and actions, all those things are things we need to think about as a discipline. And I think that there's a way, like there'd be a way to, it won't work in every class, but there'd be a way to do an assignment like you did um, that basically said like, Look at our topic in our subject, whatever it is that we're doing in this class. Now, here's like um, Eidolon articles or whatever else about like how that subject fits in the world. And now do a podcast about that, right? Do the crossover where, where you have idea. to understand the topic in order to talk about it. So I've done in classes, I've done Eidolon pitches as an assignment. 
and said, like, pitch me. Uh, they used to have, they don't do as much anymore, so I'd have to change my assignment now, but they used to have the compare the ancient and the modern. Like, they used to have a lot of articles like that. Um, you know, this is the modern version of the ancient, whatever. So I had my students pitch me articles on that model. Um, and so they had to, they didn't write the articles for me. They just did the pitch. Uh, and I think you could do a similar thing with podcasts where you say, like, you know, read a couple of these articles or read these things or, or, or like, you'd have to be careful with this, but, like, show them some examples of some of the bad stuff that's out there carefully and with thought because otherwise it, it could backfire spectacularly. And say, like, all right, you have to understand heroism in the Achille in, and Achilles well enough to talk about how that impacts toxic masculinity. And I want you to talk, I want a, a podcast, on, you know, I mean, obviously you'd give them latitude to come up with the topics, but that would be a, a suggest, like, a kind of thing you could do. Give me that. Make that the podcast point and maybe even send them to, as you say, listen to other podcasts that are doing that work. Um, in a useful way and then have them come back and so now you're incorporating the ancient they have to understand the ancient stuff get gives them that window into we have to think about the impact of what we're studying on the modern world this is not a decontextualized life of the mind over here totally. this is a real thing and then also gives them the empathetic understanding that podcasting has i think that that's would be a doable. terrific idea <laughs> i mean I, you'd have to I think it would be worth thinking up a bunch of possible topics and like doing some thinking and framing how you're going to do it and some mo model some ideas because it could be done really simplistically. Like it could end up being like too shallow if you don't give them enough of a model of how to do it. But I think it could be done. I firmly believe that we need to prepare students to encounter the material in the class mm -hmm. out in the world and to be able to assess it critically out in the world mm -hmm. because people are still fighting right up until the present over the power of the classics to lend legitimacy to their point of view. Mm -hmm. So they are going to engage their, whether they like it or not, they're going to come across material from the courses and they need the kind of reflective analytical capacities in order to understand understand it, understand what's going on, yeah. and be able to assess, you know, is this legitimate or not, you mm -hmm. know? To see how it's being invoked and not just spend their time checking for inaccuracies in Gladiator, right? Exactly. Like not come out saying, exactly. oh, now I know enough to be pedantic in a movie. That is... Not helpful. Un unimportant. Right. <laughs> like the opposite of helpful. Well, and frankly, boring. Yeah. Yes. Right? It, it then just becomes a little list of, uh, you know, wearing the wrong type of armor here in, in, in this scene or whatever. Who wants to read, you know, who wants to engage with that kind of a material? And you just go back to the ancient versions and you see that Greeks and Romans tolerated discrepancies between different versions. They were totally cool with it. Yeah, so yeah. who's to say that uh, this this discrepancy is is some awful, awful, immoral thing? You know, mm -hmm. I don't know that it is. Maybe, it, maybe the virtue is that it can be used in this flexible way. So, I mean, obviously that is, is something that's very applicable to medieval studies because it is being invoked by many people <laughs> uh, for, you know, very nefarious, very nefarious purposes. Um, and, and the thing is, it's not just, and this is the, the kind of current sort of discussion pain point that's going on at the moment, it's not just a question of like the alt-right invoking these symbols or ideas or um, imagery from the Middle Ages and putting them to, you know, white supremacist purposes. There is also a growing awareness that, in fact, the very field itself grew out itself out of white supremacism, white supremacism, uh, that the, you know, the founders of this field were already thinking along those lines, the U European superiority. Uh, and uh, there is now, you know, kind of a backlash against not just the current use by the alt-right, but in in terms of the history of the field is now being questioned and uh, people are being kind of very critical of that. And I, and I think that's a really important discussion that needs to happen. And you can't send students into, you know, you can't send students out into the world unaware that this is happening. And you also can't send students into your discipline if that is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you're training students yeah, who are going to go into your discipline, uh, it's irresponsible to send them in uh, unprepared and it's irresponsible to send them in unknowingly or unthinkingly perpetuating it, right? Either of those is not, we can't do that. You can't teach a medieval a course on medieval material anymore without addressing this, yeah. right? 
because you're either anti or for. Like, there's no in between. Like, either the way you teach it is going to support this these problems, or it is going to counter these problems. If you don't do anything, you like the default, the I'm not going to politicize it role simply supports the status quo and the status quo is a problem. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is, I mean, this is our contribution as humanists, right? Is, is preparing our students to think critically in these, in these ways, you know, about the material I, that, that we teach about kind of who's using this material for mm-hmm. what benefit, for what ends, to legitimize what point of view, what ideology. And this is also why I think it is crucial for classics to be public facing. Oh, because yeah. if we give up on this, there are a whole host of people who want to use classics, I would guess medieval studies as well, Yeah, absolutely. for ideological ends that we don't support. And by the way, these are the people who are the least interested in the subject matter, who know the least about it, who want the prestige mm-hmm. of referencing it without the inconvenience of actually studying stu- it grappling with any details of the of the subject. Yeah. Well, except uh, uh, when it's not. Except when it's the specialists who are also doing that. Yeah. That is I mean th- there Which are, is awful and I hate that we have to say that. that but too, like it's that's true, true too. I yeah. mean we can't it is important to say that it's not you everything you said is correct. Like there's a whole ton of people out there who are doing exactly that. But there's also a separate piece which is obviously not unrelated, of people who should freaking well know better, yes. uh, but uh, who are very well uh, educated in certain ways about the subject and who are not only willing to let it slide, but are actively perpetuating these problems and who want to, who want the things, the same things, frankly. Well, That's that there absolutely are scholars, uh, in, certainly I know of, in medieval studies who are racist and are actively uh, spreading this message. These are scholars, senior scholars in the field. So it's not just, you know, kind of a fringe or something like that. It's like right at the core of the thing. And at the same time, not everyone, of course. And so it's not like the field is diseased all the way through. And this is exactly what I'm watching this happen in, in medieval studies in a very open and ongoing way right now. And we don't, but we have this, it's going on right now, right? Um, in classics, the Paideia stuff, frankly, yeah. Yeah. is exactly this. And I mean, we are faced with people who are happy to invoke the classics as legitimacy for a certain view of Western civilization who are in the field, who are teaching in the field and are experts in the field. So, yeah. And I, so I can, how can I teach students about, frankly, anything to do with the ancient world without this being part of what I'm teaching them. And beyond classics, these skills that we're imparting to students Mm -hmm. are essential for creating, I think, engaged citizens of the world. People. Right, yeah. yeah. People People. should be. Right. and Teaching them to people properly. (laughs) Exactly. And so I think that, you know, getting out there, playing, Mm -hmm. playing a role in terms of making... The humanities, generally speaking, more public facing in this way, I just I think it's just crucial. Mm-hmm. And the thing that so the thing that I think about a lot is, you know, astronomy has Neil deGrasse Tyson. I guess we have Mary Beard, mm-hmm. which, you know, um, trust me, Neil deGrasse Tyson is also a mm. yes, <laughs> so, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, none of these people, nobody's pure. I'll give it that. But, you know, and none of these people are unproblematic, but we have some we have some people out there. I also, work. and I'm willing to forgive people who make mistakes. Yes. People who and, say. Uh, sorry, I should just say for anyone who knows the background to both of those comments, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Mary Beard are very differently problematic, and Mary Beard is not problematic in the way Neil deGrasse Tyson is. I was not making an accusation right. against Mary right. in any way about right. some of the things that have been made as accusations against Neil deGrasse Tyson. So just just to clear that up, if you know the stories behind those. Yes, <laughs> yes. And and I'm I'm kind of speaking in terms of people who are thinking about getting involved in public classics that they absolutely should that there is if they make some sort of faux pas they sincerely apologize for it admit it as such you know i think that people are are willing to uh forgive but when people um you know are kind of complicit in colonialist Mm -hmm. discourses as some people people are are, (laughs) 
then um you know then it's kind of you know then i think it's kind of like maybe bad for the field in, yeah. in those instances well and i think yeah. that's part of the know. problem is that i do I, I think classics has to be public Getting facing awfully serious yeah i know that's <laughs> all right cut out as much as, as, much as <laughs> no no this i mean this is stuff where, where we are absolutely interested in talking about ongoing in our podcast this is something that's very important to both of us um i think that public facing classics needs to be public facing we also need to accept those of us who have a particular viewpoint on what classics is need to accept that some people who are going to do public facing scholarship are going to do public facing scholarship we disagree with yeah. and we do not think represents our field well because it has been such an ingrained part of our field the only way to deal with that is to also do public facing scholarship totally. right we can't we can't say well then it's you know like as you say we can't abandon the field uh, that was a like a wartime metaphor, not a yeah. <laughs> discipline. I mean, like we can't just walk back away from it and say we can't get engaged in that battle uh, and leave them to be the only face of it. Like Mary Beard is a great face of classics in the sense that she is extremely popular and well known, and many people have come to classics through her. Uh, she and has she done does, many wonderful things. Yes, and she deserves credit for those wonderful things. And that she she's absolutely done. does. Absolutely. She has also done things that I disagree with and do not yes. represent the field as I want it represented. Agreed. How do I deal with that? Well, I can try to persuade her to be different and people are doing that and that's fine but really realistically i don't know her personally the only thing i can really do is put my version of classics out there and say and be persuasive and be compelling and try to be engaging with that and you know it really comes down to and and be also you know academically sound and all of those things so that i can't be picked apart on those on those details uh, and and so the more people who are doing that, the better. And right now, I will say that in terms of ac classics podcasts, there are tons that are being done not by academics uh, that are very good, and there are tons that's being done not by academics that are, like it's a really an amazing number of classics podcasts. That's true. I would say I can't vouch for all of them because there's uh, there's a certain capacity limit in my ability to listen to classics podcasts. I have been like adding them in, and then at a certain point, I kind of was like, you know what? A know a lot of this and B like I, there's only so much I can do. I can only so much classics I can listen to. I so I haven't heard them understand. all, and um, some of them this may not be true of. Of the ones I know, I think everyone is doing a good job on this front that I care about. Like in podcasting, I don't specifically know of, and frankly, if there are ones that are doing what I would consider wrong classics, like I mean, I think there's a right way and a wrong way to talk about classics. Let's be straightforward here. If there are people who are doing the wrong way, uh, I don't know of them, but I would actually be interested in knowing about them because I certainly don't want to be going around recommending them or sure. p pushing them or whatever. But like the ones I know, the ones being done by academics are like, you know, they're on the right the right side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the right, as far as I'm concerned. And I think that's amazing. I think that's why it's such a, a valuable thing right now is that like this is a different voice and it's good. This is the thing that just gets me charged up is like, you know, we have to represent, um, you know, and I think that this applies not just to classics, but to the humanities as a whole. We need to get out there and say we are doing critical public service. We are shaping society. We're shaping people who can act and think in responsible ways. And that is, this is the work that we do, I believe, is utterly integral. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we need to just change this narrative about offering you know a kind of secularized spiritual satisfaction <laughs> or enjoyment you know life of the mind we are doing critical a critical public service in in the information that we help students acquire the reasoning skills that we help them acquire the ability to think about things in context i get the sense that we in the humanities really need to speak about the serious serious benefits that we are giving to so many students mm -hmm. because we are really doing good work you know <laughs> and it really matters a lot and it sh it's not you know it should not be optional it, yeah. it is it is essential our work yeah. is essential and i mean bringing it back to podcast this this is a crucial role that we should be playing or at least should be playing more uh than we already are because again uh, you know it, it can't just be for those lucky enough to to be in our classes yeah totally exactly you know i think that's a pretty good note to end on impassioned plea fight. for our subject <laughs> everybody go out there and convince the world that humanities will save it 
<laughs> after we've managed climate change. It will but, you know. play a role. <laughs> yeah. Amongst yeah. many other things, yeah. it, I, I believe it will play a role. Absolutely. And um, the revolution will be podcast. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so thank you so much, Scott, not only for being on the podcast or letting us be on your podcast either way, but also for providing the microphones and equipment. <laughs> much appreciated. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on and coming on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you so much for inviting me to present at this conference. I've had just a blast uh, meeting so many great people. So I really appreciate it. And it was really fun to finally meet you in person. And thank you all the listeners for listening to this. <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll be back at you next time. Bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.